smiley faces. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, are you ready back there, Dave? Awesome. Lord, we come before you, and we just thank you, and we praise you for you. We thank you, Lord, for this word that you've given me. I pray that everyone who is in earshot, whether it be here personally, online, or whatever, whoever hears this word, Lord, that you would give them eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive your truth. I thank you and I praise you for the truth that is coming forth, and I pray no offenses to anyone who is listening in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So how is everybody? Great. Good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, so the title of my message is, How Are You Coping These Days? And our foundational scripture is Philippians 4, 7, which I'm going to read first. Um, I've got here, I've got here that we're going to read it in three different versions. So it's Philippians 4, 7. In my Bible, it says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will protect your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Uh, Philippians 4, 7. New Living Translation says, Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And the message says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. So we're talking about peace, and specifically the peace of God. We do know, or many of us know, that the peace of God is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Okay? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, tenderness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. I believe in the days that we're living right now, people need peace more than anything else. I also believe, having been a believer for many years, that there are many, many, many Christians who are not walking in peace. And that's sad. It's sad because, again, it's a free gift that's given to us. <clears throat> I've got here, we have the cause, okay? What's the cause? The cause is the fear-demic, as we call it. Regardless of what anybody believes, fear, fear is being driven by the media, the medical field, and sadly, our government, okay? Do we understand that fear, when people are walking in fear, is the easiest way to control them? Honey, can you do me a favor? Can you turn that fan on me? Uh, yeah, please. I know that there are many people, and I don't, I don't want to get into this whole, you know, because many people say, oh, it's a conspiracy theory and so on and so forth. But the reality is this. We live in a day and age where there are men and women who have a lot of money and think that they know what's best for humanity. These same people believe that there's way too many people on the face of the earth. Okay, hear me when I say this. You, I, everything I'm saying, you can find if you go and you search for it on the internet. It's there. It, I, they're not hiding anything, okay? It's, it's blatantly in our face. This is how they feel. There's too many people on the face of the earth, and so we need to get rid of them. And what better way to get rid of them than to control them? So people are struggling with things that they're being told, all kinds of lies, okay? Um, like, like, for instance, still, two years past, or not two years past, but now that the, the pandemic has passed, and, and I'll call it a planned pandemic, because this was, no, this, was, this was not something that, it took many, many people by surprise, because I think we weren't expecting such a horrific thing, okay? 
but it truly was planned. And again, I'm not gonna get into all that. You can find the information for yourself. And if you can't, find someone who knows about it and they'll, they'll, they'll help you. Because you, you gotta see it with your own eyes, okay? But so they're, they're, we're struggling with this and we're struggling with the fact that many places, like if you go into a uh, medical doctor's office, not all of them, but a lot of them still make you wear masks, okay? Um, social distancing. There are many, many places that are still commanding social distancing. And listen, you know, people that have common sense, you know, I, I don't believe, I don't care where you are, there's no need for us to be on top of people. If you're standing in line, you don't need to be on top of them, you know, but a, a, a foot between you or whatever, that, that's understandable. I mean, that's more than enough, okay? But they want us six feet apart because, you know, if you breathe on me, I'm going to catch what you've got. Well, that may be true, okay? They're not lying about that. But most people, again, with common sense, aren't going to be out in public if they're not feeling well. Now, I'm not saying everybody, okay? Because what did God give us all? He gave us free will. We have the ability to discern for ourselves, to, to use judgment, but unfortunately, we live in a world where people aren't taught these things. I mean, it's not, I feel like I'm lecturing the, you know, you people know this, you know what I'm telling you. It's not, it, this isn't anything that we're not aware of. But the reality is, especially with the generation, the younger generations, they're not teaching their children how to be respectful, how to be, you know, yeah, how to use their own mind. Because in the schools, the schools are teaching them, you can't think for yourself. I've got to tell you how to think, okay? This, again, is a reality. You know, we, we hold New York informed meetings here, and we've had people come in, and the stuff that I have learned about what they're doing to our children in the churches is absolutely sickening. Thank God my kids are all grown and gone. Sadly, I have a lot of grandchildren, and a lot of them are in school. Not all of them, because I'll tell you, with what I've learned, I believe every human being who has a child should be homeschooling their child. Amen. And that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> you want to talk about it later? We can talk. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, and we're also seeing the unbelievable inflation. I mean, I went, to, I went to BJ's the other day and about fell over. I went to buy paper plates. 600 paper plates. Do you know how much 600 paper plates are at BJ's now? $25.99. I used to pay $11.99 for the same thing. $25.99. My mom likes the little, the small little paper plates. And usually those are about $14.99. $21.79 for 330 of those. This is called inflation, folks. Again, very planned. However, we have the answer as well. Praise the Lord. So are you finding yourself worrying, fretful, anxious, any of those things? I hope as a believer that you're not. But again, I'm seeing it. There are believers out there who are walking in this fear. I, I, I blame the pastors to a certain extent because I think that, you know, God gave us a pulpit to stand up here and preach truth and teach truth. If we're up here and we're not preaching and teaching truth that's going to affect our portion of the body, shame on us, okay? We've got so many big churches around that are just in there to do their own thing to, I'm going to say, collect a paycheck, uh, you know, and, I, and, and I, don't, I don't know that that's necessarily all of their hearts, but I see it with a lot of the bigger ones, and it's very, very sad, you know, it, we, Pastor Bob and I do this on a strictly volunteer basis. We don't get paid to be here, <clears throat> okay? But I do it because I've been called to this, and I believe that the Lord says I need someone to truly guide my people, lead and guide them. Listen, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I'm arri I've arrived, okay? I'm still human. I still live in this stinking flesh, so I make mistakes too. And if I offend you or Pastor Bob offends you, do me a favor I think every one of you has our phone number. Pick up the phone and call us. We are available to sit and talk, okay? Okay, that all aside, 
worry and the and the things like it, the fretfulness, the anx- blah, 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 the anxiousness, all that stuff is absolutely useless. Okay, it'll wear you out mentally, emotionally, and physically. Look at the people. I mean, I have a cousin who worries about everything. Now, thank God she's not ill a lot, but she does have some typical ailments, I believe, of worrying. High blood pressure, fretfulness, okay? We don't have to have this. We don't have to walk in this. But when we worry and we I, I, I guess I don't know. Do we want to say you choose to worry? I don't. She's done it for so long. I don't think if she would that she would know how to not worry. I mean, I know you can get to that point if you've been a worrier. You can get to the point where you don't worry, but it's not something that God. It, it's not, I don't. I don't know if I would call it a sin, although I guess you could because it goes against the Word of God. Go ahead. Here, you want mine? Is this on? Sorry. It's not talking. Anyways. Anyway, so what I was going to say is worry is a manifestation of fear. Oh, there you go. So we know it's not from God. It doesn't resolve anything in any way, shape, or form, okay? Peace of mind is valuable, and without it, it's impossible, impossible to enjoy life. Seek out the peace of God that is yours. Let's read John 14, 27. <clears throat> Pastor Bob's favorite, favorite book. 14, 27. <clears throat> Excuse me. John 14, 27 says... Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We are, we are told by God, go to verse 1. I think Pastor Bob wants to take over my sermon here. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's Jesus, yeah. Okay, so basically he's telling us we don't, we don't need to, to live in fear. We don't need to be anxious about anything. Listen, if you think that God is dumbstruck over the fact that this has happened, you're, you're sadly wrong. God knows everything. He knows every single step of your life, my life, your neighbor's life, and the, and the like, okay? He is well aware of what is going on. If he's well aware of it, and if he tells us continually in his word to walk in peace, don't you think we ought to walk in peace? Listen, I know it's not always easy, but I also know when you find yourself in that situation and you go and you talk to God and ask him to help you with it, he is so, so, so faithful. Okay? Peace is one of the free gifts given to us as believers from God. If you choose not to walk in it, guess what? You won't have it. You must open it, walk in it, and utilize it. You have your part to do. You've all heard me say this a billion times. God has done everything he's going to do, but we still have our part to do, okay? So don't be deceived into believing that you can't help what you think. You absolutely can. You can change your mind about anything. Practice on-purpose thinking instead of being passive and just waiting to see what, what thoughts fall into your mind. This is one of those things. Like I've said, we have our part to do. The Word of God tells us to take every thought captive. If it tells us to do it, guess what? We can do it. God's not going to ask us to do something that we're incapable of doing. You have to make the effort. You have to put the effort forth to do what he's telling you to do, but you can do it because God's never going to tell you to do something you can't do, ever, okay? Start paying attention to what's stealing your peace. If you don't know what it is, take an inventory of your life when you lay down at night. What happened? What, what thoughts went through your mind? What kind of actions happened that caused you to not be in peace? And then work on it. Work on changing it. Because listen, you know, we as believers have this idea that, you know, we hear a great message and, oh my gosh, so-and-so needed to hear this word. And yeah, that, that may be true, but you probably need it more than they do. 
honestly. Too many times we're concerned about getting the other person to hear it, getting the other person to hear it. God says, I need you and your character developed so that I can get you to do what I need you to do. I want to use you. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've stood before the Lord and said, here I am, Lord, use me. And he's going, but, but wait a minute, I need this, this, that, and the other thing taken care of first. Are you going to work on them yet? He doesn't say that to just me. <laughs> he says that to each and every one of us. Are we paying attention? Understand, you are, you are a child of God. Have you given your life to the Lord? Then you're a child of God, period, okay? And you have your peace. He's given it to you. It wasn't something you had to work for. The only thing you had to do was make Jesus the Lord of your life, and boom, you got it. You know, it took me a long time when I realized the fruits of the Spirit, and I thought, you know, oh my gosh. Now, <laughs> many of you don't know me and, and have never known me as anything but a pastor, but once upon a time, I wasn't a pastor. And once upon a time, I was one of the most foulest women you could have ever met in your whole entire life. My husband said to, to me at one time, your mouth is worse than that of a truck driver's. I kid you not. I was that bad. If God can change me, he can change you. Okay? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm living proof. <laughs> Ask God to help you to walk in it. If you're having trouble, you know, and we're going to read this scripture. We're going to go to James 4, but he tells us that we have not because we ask not. So we're going to go to James 4. Oops. Oh, wow. Couldn't find any emery boards earlier. I'm finding them all now. I think I must have been using them as bookmarks. <laughs> Where did James go? James 4. <clears throat> James 4, 2b, I'm going to start with. Now, we'll just read James 2, 2 through 4, or 2, through, 2 and 3. It says, you lust and do not have, so you kill. You desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. I can't get any clearer than that, guys. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may send it, spend it on your passions. I'm not going to get into all that. I guess we didn't really need to read three. But the fact of the matter is so many times we find ourselves in a situation and we go to our friends, we go to our family, we go to our neighbors, we moan and complain and gripe about whatever the situation is. And then, oh, wait a minute, after we've talked to everybody and haven't come up with, come up with anything, we might think, oh, I should have asked God. It's something that we have to learn and practice to do every single time. And listen, I'm not criticizing anybody. I mean, we were talking about it yesterday. How many times do you find yourself in a situation and just that? You're doing, 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 and, and, and trying to figure out how to, to, to resolve the situation, whatever it is, and then, oh my goodness, why didn't I ask God? We want it to be the first thing we do is ask God. Lord, why am I going through? And, and that, that's usually a good thing you know, if you're going through a particular situation, you know, maybe it's, you know, I, I never have money at the end of the week. What is going on, Lord? You know what I mean? Sit and have a discussion with God. You know, I've gone, I've, I've said this a zillion times, if not once. We took that Bible study, how to, um, how to Hear the Voice of God by Mark Verkler. And he teaches you how to do two-way journal with the Lord. I'll tell you, it was the best class I've ever taken. Just sit. You know, we, we tend to do it in our minds a lot of times, but when you write it out, your thoughts, your questions, and his responses, then you can actually have something to go back to. And you're like, oh, wow. Wow, I, I didn't really, I didn't interpret that right, or I didn't do that, or whatever, whatever, whatever. But it's a great tool. Learn how to talk to God and listen to what he's saying to you. He has the answer. He has the answer to every single situation we will ever face in our whole entire life. You know, the, the Word of God tells us there's nothing new under the sun. 
That wasn't just then when the word of God was written. It's still today. Nothing new. God's not surprised by these things. Okay, and then lastly, give the situation to God. And once you do, remind the enemy that it's in God's hands. So this thought comes back to you, and it keeps coming back. I remember when Pastor Bob and I closed our business and all that we went through. And I'll bet you for two weeks straight, you know, we had, we had the house out on the water, and I think there were 14 stairs going up. I paced those stairs like I've never paced anything in my life for two weeks straight. And I told the enemy off, I can't tell you how many times. A thought would no sooner come into my mind, and I'd be like, nope, you know what, Satan? It's in God's hands. You got a problem with it? Go deal with him. I had to keep doing it because I wasn't used to it. But I, every day it got less and less and less to the point that I didn't have to do that anymore. But for the first two weeks, I paced stairs a lot. And I argued with the enemy a lot. He didn't like what I had to say. <laughs> I, Bob and I and this church have been through so much training over the last couple of years and you know we got involved with the whole thing out in Batavia and with Pastor Paul out there and he has brought in some absolutely amazing trainers and teachers and was it last weekend we went we went for another training on evangelism. It was the best I've ever had in my whole entire life. I, absolutely the best. Pastor ba Paul Alou. Alou. And we are going to bring him here after the first of the year. You guys will love this man. He's absolutely amazing. But long story short, I seen firsthand the love of God in action. Now listen, I'm not saying that we don't see it here, that we don't walk in it. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is for evangelism, my heart has always been family, friends, the body of Christ here, okay? But to see the love of God in action on people, we had, we had no idea who these people were. We went out into the streets of Batavia. And to see it in action, I can't, I, I, I honestly don't have the words to give you for what I felt and what I seen. It was absolutely amazing. And I want you guys to experience what we did because you, it's life changing. It really and truly is life changing. We argue and debate over such petty things. You know, it was funny when, when you had the, I think it was the first song up there and we seen all the stars. And I thought, I was looking at that thinking, my gosh, you know, if we had a clue how sometimes our thoughts and our actions are like that, but we make them this big, you know what I mean? And God's going, that's nothing, it's just a drop in the bucket. I, I can't even tell you how amazing this was. Um, I learned more than anything else, we have each other, and the body of Christ needs to get it together. We need to, more than anything else, learn to work together. You know, we live in an area, and I know it's not just here, hear me, but we live in an area where, sadly, people won't come from other churches to hear a speaker or a trainer many times because their pastor won't let them. Sadly. Listen, you guys, you don't need our permission. If you hear of somebody you want to go see that's at another church, you, you don't, you're, not, you're not ours, okay? You're God's. And if that's where God needs you to be to get trained up, then by golly, go. Hear me, okay? Just so you know, if you think you need our permission, you don't. You're free to go. <laughs> and, but it, it's very true. We, we, we don't see it a lot. The body of Christ needs to learn to work together. And I don't know how God's going to do it, especially in this area, because in this area, it's very, very difficult to get people to kind of intermingle with other churches, sadly. Um, God is not going to ask us why we did not help someone when the need was right in front of us. When, we're, when we pass and we go stand before God, he's not going to say, you know, well, what was your reason? It's not going to happen. 
Listen, you've been giving gifts, talents, and, and, and other things, and sometimes it's to help somebody. And sometimes when you hear of somebody going through something, it's for a reason. You don't need to go to the pastor and say, well, I heard about, about, about. okay, listen, you all know how to hear God for yourselves. We've taught you that and we're still teaching and we're still learning. And I know that we're all learning and growing and we learn and grow at different levels and different speeds and so on and so forth. But the fact of the matter is if you hear of a need and you have the ability to help somebody in some way, shape or form, form and you don't, shame on you, okay? I'm, listen, I'm not trying to be, a mother granny up here giving you the wah, 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 you're such a bad person. But the fact of the matter is you guys have a heart and you have Jesus's heart and you're here for a reason. You know, we say it all the time. We're Jesus's hands and feet. Well, how are you being his hands and feet if you're not helping? Really? Right? I mean, we try to make, when we know of things that are going on, we try to make it known to you. I know that life still happens, people still need to work, and so on and so forth, so there's not everything that you can be a part of, okay? But trust me, it's like Bob and I were talking yesterday here when, when we were doing the thing. If everybody had come, um, and, and, and again, I'm not trying to beat anybody up, but what I'm saying is if everybody had come, there's something for everyone to do. I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you're disabled in any way, shape, or form. There's always something to do. If there's an outreach, you can go, you can pray. You may not be able to walk and hand things out, but you can pray. You can pray for people that come to you. You can pray for those that are going out. Prayer is, is something nobody has an excuse to not do, okay? That, let me just say that. Nobody has an excuse to not pray. We can all be praying. Even if you can't make it to the function, whatever it is, you can be at home praying. You can be at work praying. Okay? Because we, listen, prayers work, guys. They work. And I'm going to get into to that a little bit. Um, listen, there's going to be more storms. There's going to be more pandemics. There's going to be more lack. And I believe it's going to be in numerous proportion. Because the end is getting closer, the enemy is ticked off, and he's going to try everything he possibly can. And from what we went through with the pandemic, as I say, I think that a good portion of the body of Christ isn't even remotely close to being ready. Nope. And I won't get into why you all know my feelings on that, okay? <clears throat> And even in the midst of all these things that are still going to come, that we're still going to go through, we're still called to help. Still called to help, okay? Um, we have been commissioned to show the love of God to others, and especially to those that do not know the Lord. Especially the, to those that do not know the Lord. You know, uh, for years, Cornerstone has gone out, Cornerstone Community Fellowship has gone out, and we've been praying at the mall. And we don't do it every month. We don't do it every year. But in through the pandemic, it was hard. But we did do it. But let me tell you, with this evangelist, evangelism that we learned about this past week, I, I'm telling you, I, I could go through the mall right now and not have an issue talking to anyone, anyone. One, one of the things that we learned that was so amazing to me, and, and I think that we all know it, and when I say it, you'll be like, well, yeah, duh, but we don't talk about it. We don't think about it. We were, um, we had gone out into the streets, and he divided us up into groups, and so it was Pastor Bob, myself, Pastor Paul, and there were three other girls. And uh, at one point, the girls were kind of complaining that they had gone up to a car, and there were two girls standing outside of the car, and there were a bunch of people in the car. And the girl was like, well, we prayed, and da-da-da-da-da, but I think they were doing drugs. And, da and he said, wait a minute, stop right there. He said, you need to understand something. It is not your job to get them saved from whatever their addiction is. Drugs, alcohol, pornography, spending money, whatever. It does not, that is not your job. Your job is to win their soul for the kingdom, period. And I went, oh my word. Like, how simple is that? You know, I used to say, well, I don't understand. We can't go out and get all these people saved, and then where are we going to send them? We got to worry about where we send them. Listen, 
when you got saved or even you may have been saved for years, the God, but God led you here or wherever. Do you think that God didn't lead you? I mean, like I know when I got saved, the Lord led me down into the city. Okay. The Lord led me. I was a, I was a not, in fact, when I went to the church, I was still a non-believer because I didn't get saved until after I had gone there for a few weeks. But the Lord led me there. If he can lead me, do you think he can't lead that newly saved person? And do you think that he might have a reason why he's sending them here instead of there? We're so concerned about them. And, and hear me, because we are supposed to make disciples and we are supposed to people help people grow and mature in the Lord. That is part of the commission. But it's not our job to worry about every single soul we get saved and where the Lord sends them. There's other believers out there that actually do believe like we do. It's kind of amazing. And knows how to work with them and help them mature and grow in the Lord. I mean, I can't tell you how simple this was and how amazing it was to learn and to actually do. Did you want to say something? Okay. Okay. So now we know that we've just gone through the whole Ian storm down in Florida, going up into South Carolina and all. And I just want to share with you that um, I personally know of several individuals who lost much or all of everything. Does it grieve me? Absolutely. However, we need to understand something. I am not saying God doesn't love them because they lost everything or they lost a good portion of what they had. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is this. When you give your life to the Lord and you learn how to pray, he will protect you. I say this because I think back to when Katrina happened. Many of you may know of Jesse Duplantis or heard of Jesse Duplantis, a very famous uh, evangelist. And I won't get into what he has and whatever, but he has a huge, beautiful home down in Louisiana. Was right, that the eye of the storm was headed right for, right for where his house was. And he was in bed, they were in bed that night, and the Lord told him, get up, go outside, and anoint every single fence post, and whatever all he told him to do. But the Lord instructed him on what to do. And needless to say, they were praying, and I'm sure everybody they were affiliated with was praying for them. Do you know they did not lose a shingle off their house or their business? And yet, places all around them were completely devastated. Does God love Jesse more than he loves you or me? Absolutely not. The sad thing is the world out there doesn't know, doesn't understand, and doesn't get it. And I know that there are those that will ridicule and, and or do ridicule about these evangelists. And, so, and I'm not saying... I mean, there are good and there are bad. There are good people... There are, what, are the, what does the word of God tell us? There are those that are in wolf's clothing, clothing trying to be sheep. Sheep in wolf's clothing. So I'm not saying that they're not out there, okay? But this is why it's so important for us to mature in the Lord, to learn discernment and how to know, okay? Because the enemy will use whatever he can. I've said for years, we may, I've been on the, Lord, the earth for 56 years. Guess what? The enemy's been here a whole lot longer than that. He knows exactly what buttons to push to get me to do what he wants me to do. And that goes for every single one of us. So don't think that you can't be deceived. Okay, hear me when I say that. Don't think that even as a believer, you can't be deceived. You can be. We, that's why it's so important to stay connected with the Lord. It's so important to stay in line with the Lord and what he's telling us to do. I can't... I can't say this enough. My heart goes out to one of my best friends who lost everything. And I was going back and forth with her last night on Messenger. 
And I said, I am so sorry you're going through this. And she said, Kathy, it's not the house. It's not the house being gone. It's all the memories, all the pictures that I'll never get back. Now listen, I've been praying for her for years. I have been sending her information for years. She's just not there yet. I'm praying, I'm praying that the Lord will send someone into her path that she will be able to receive from so she can learn of the Lord the way that I have, the way that you have, because that's our protection, guys. The Lord loves us, and he loves our things. You know, I, like I said, we could get off onto all kinds of tangents about that. It's neither here nor there. God loves them as much as he loves us. The fact of the matter is they're not walking with him. So they didn't have the protection, okay? Well, you would think, but I don't know. I, I, we got to, you know, they're, they're, in, in, in all reality, the sad part about it is they weren't even in town when it happened. Well, it is, but it's a bad thing because their kids were there. So long story short, you know, I'm just waiting for the opportunity. Now, listen, like I said, don't get mad at me. I'm just giving you truth here. I'm, I'm, I, you know, God loves these people. He doesn't hate them. He's not trying to destroy, destroy them. He's not. They just need to give their lives to him, period. Um, go ahead. One thing we have to remember is hurricanes and destruction i should say any type of destruction is not from god right it is from satan john 10:10 10, 10 is very clear the enemy comes the enemy comes to kill destroy and to steal that's it Okay. Okay. I, I think it's in Matthew. And well, the point is, you know, Jesus was. Think, do you think that somehow those people were worse sinners because they were saying, you know? And he said, uh, I, mean, I can't remember the verse, but I was looking at the podcast the other day, and uh, and they, they said, to, uh, you know, you need to repent, unless you should, you must, you should perish. That's right. In other words, don't think that just because that you know that that, that, that happened to them that somehow they had it coming. Right. You know, and just you know, and that, that, you, know, that, you know, that needs to be the case for repenting instead of oh well, you know, well, some of water, so much open stuff going on, or whatever. You know. Well, it's like I said before. It's not like um, you know. Don't be deceived that you that it couldn't happen to you. Okay. I mean, God knows it all. God understands it all. And I, you know, we can say, okay, so with, in the, in the, in the, in the story of Katrina with Jesse Duplantis, God bless him. You know, they, they lost nothing, but there are still believers that would lose stuff. Now I can give you my opinion and my thoughts and ideas on why that is. I'm not going to get into that now, but there's, 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 I have some thoughts and ideas on why that does happen to believers. But the fact of the matter is it comes down to you've got, you've got the unbeliever and the believer. And there's your dividing line, in my opinion. That's the dividing line. Then you've got the degrees of how much damage and so on and so forth. Again, God, God's will is that none... None means none. None means zero. Zero. None should perish. Okay? And part of this is we have to understand it's our job as God's hands and feet to be the ones out there getting their souls saved. Don't be so thinking concerned. And, 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 and listen, I'm talking to me here. Don't be so concerned about where they're going to go to church. Be concerned that their soul is saved for the kingdom. Glory be to God. It's all about the kingdom, guys. It's not about Cornerstone Community Fellowship. It's not about the gathering place or abundant life or this church or that church or the other thing. It's about the kingdom, period. When we get that mentality, I think things are going to change because we have to understand God is about saving souls. Saving souls, period. Okay, I want to read uh, Romans 2. We're going to read a few... Uh, things here, but Romans 2, 10 
through 12. To 10 through 12. Romans 2, 10 through 12 says, But glory, honor, and peace will be to every man who does good work, to the Jew first and then the Gentile. For there is no partiality with God. As many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and as many as, and as, many as have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Basically, he's saying here, I am no respecter of persons. Okay? He doesn't care about, he cares about whether your soul is saved. That's what he cares about. He cares about your character. But even that, your soul needs to be saved before he can even work on your character. Because once you get saved, oh my, how you change. Oh my, how you change. God knows what he's doing, guys. Okay, I also want to read John 3, 5 through 8. Me and all my bookmarkers here. <laughs> Okay, Jesus 3, 5 through 8 says, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. He's telling us, I'm, again, you can't get much clearer than that. You've got to be born again. To be born again is to give your life to the Lord. And your life will change. I promise you for the better. Doesn't mean you won't go through some things. Hear me. I remember when I first got saved and everybody was saying, oh, you get saved and life is just, it's just a bed of roses. It's all peaches and cream. I can't tell you that that's happened for me. We've been through some stuff, but we've been through some stuff in the midst of peace. We weren't freaking out. We weren't going haywire. We weren't out getting drunk and stoned and everything else because we couldn't deal with it. We coped with it. God gave us what we needed so we could cope with it without falling apart. And then I want to read Matthew seven twenty four. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. Getting saved is one of those things. Getting born again is one of those things. He will liken you to a wise man who built his house on a rock. <sighs> So God is no respecter of persons. Persons, He shows us no. He shows no partiality, except with those He's dealing with, or who have, have dealing with His children who have given their lives to Him. That's where I guess you could say the partiality comes from, huh? Favor. You get favor. I mean, you still, you still hear me. You still have your part to do. It's not just. I'm saved, and so, voila, again, like I just said, people that are born again go through stuff. We go through stuff because God is concerned about developing our character. Our character is supposed to be becoming, be becoming more and more like Christ every single day. We have work to do, guys. It's our job to do what he tells us to do. I know that there are many people out there. In fact, I had a man that day we were in Batavia, out on the streets. One of the men, men told me that he talks to Satan daily. 
he wants to go to hell because there's going to be partying and women and da 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 And I just, I was dumbfounded. There are people out there that really believe that. They believe that heaven is boring. They have no idea, no clue. And guess what? A lot of them are going to go there if we don't get out and do what we need to do. Okay? We've been commissioned. And I'm going to end with these two scriptures. We're going to read Mark 16, 15. 15. 16, 15. Mark 16, 15 says, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all these things I commanded you, and remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen? Amen. So, your job is to go and win souls for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Lord, we just come before you and we thank you and we praise you for this word. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you're doing in and upon each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, to become more Christ-like each and every day.